Welcome to Taxon Works Together 2024. We're really glad to have you. And this morning we'll get started uh, with a little bit of overview and a quick poll to find out more about uh, you, our, our audience. So to get started, it's our fifth year and we have some things we like to do and some things we've added. So you can see in the chat and someone will repost it for those of you who've just joined us. Uh, there are group notes where we can take notes together and ask questions. So we ask that if possible, you put your questions in the Google Doc as we go through the different sessions. That way, speakers can answer your questions or any of us can answer if we know the answer uh, anytime, either during your talk or um, after as well. If you must put it in the chat, we understand and we'll grab it and stick it into the Google Doc as well. We have uh, every day a similar format. That is to say there's some group discussions, panel type, roundtables, some individual talks, uh, as well as opportunities for demos. We do have three minutes, one slide. Those of you who've been to Taxon Works Together are familiar with three minutes, one slide. And this is your opportunity. If you see something, hear something, or want to add something you haven't seen or heard to the conversation, it's your opportunity to do that. And to do three minutes, one slide, you just need to let us know, let Matt or myself know that you would like to do that. And we have a request to Sandbox account. So that's if you have not had an opportunity to poke around inside Taxon Works and you would like to, we can easily set that up for you. And today we have a choose your own adventure session that comes up uh, after the break, after lunchtime, our time. And if there's something you want to see or a special tour or a particular tool, we'd be happy to uh, accommodate you then. All these sessions will be recorded on YouTube and our code of conduct can be summed up as be kind. Uh, this is you know, a way to ensure that we all kind of understand the playing field uh, wrapped around those two tiny but important words. Um, on the right, you might notice a QR code. If that's useful to you, that is a QR code to this group notes document. With that, I would like to say uh, welcome again from all of us as team members of the Species File Group. Uh, we are located around the planet, both here uh, in Illinois, in Champaign, as well as Argentina. And you can see many of us here in the room this morning. If you check out our names, we are in the, um, in the Zoom. We have different projects. Some of you might be familiar with a few of them. Catalog of Life, uh, software that some of you likely use or are familiar with or contribute to. Uh, the Global Names Architecture, Dimitri Mozarin, building these uh, amazing tools for us to be able to find names, parse names, and verify names, as well as do things like compare name lists. And Taxon Works, which we're here to talk about today, and it's all but its connections to other things as well. And we are all uh, nested under the Prairie Research Institute here at the University of Illinois in the Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, anything you'd like to add, Matt? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. No, you'll just hear it reiterated over and over. You'll hear a lot from Debbie and myself but really this is a team effort and it's a community effort. So we, we want to make sure to, to acknowledge all of the hard work from this, this team and everybody on the team. Um, there's a lot of time and effort that's been spent to make all the cool things that you're gonna see possible here. So while you may hear from Debbie and I a lot, um, this is the team and you are the team behind it by just participating here today. At the top, you'll notice uh, the work of the person on our team who does our uh, user interface or UI, uh, UX work. And that is Jose Carriera here. And we have a brand new logo for our group, of which we're really excited and, and proud. Uh, and we hope you, you enjoy it too. And you'll, you'll be seeing more of that. Oops. Try that again. Yikes. This is uh, two things. One, it is um, we have over 30 countries registered now, 
uh, Singapore is not on this list because uh, I made this last week and that they got registered uh, like yesterday. The colors indicate number of people. So the six means if there's a country that's outlined in six, it means at least six people from that country are registered. So colors are indicate number of people. And we also noted that this is an automated service now connecting uh, a Bing search through PowerPoint slides. So you do your mapping and then it says, oh, those are the countries you want. I'll make you a map. Would you like that? And you say, yes, please. Does anybody notice something missing from this map? Australia. Australia is missing. A little piece of it is here. <laughs> So we have a, a session later in the in the week, uh, our, our collective geospatial future, and I thought this was a nice way to indicate just some of the kinds of challenges we face when we try to automate um, sharing this kind of layer information, shape information. So I left it, I left it be. Um, and if your country's not on here, I, again, I apologize, and um, you can let us know. And hopefully, in the chat, we we catch that. So with this, I have uh, gathered all of the lovely things that you shared uh, when you registered about why it is that you are here and what you'd like to learn. So I will do two things now is give you a, a minute or two to have a read of this, uh, as well as a Zoom poll to find out more about exactly who's here at this session. And now we can share the results. So you can see there's a, a lot of folks here digitizing, describing taxa. We have some users of APIs and tools like OpenRefine and our R Python code. Very cool. People who teach. So a little bit of everything. And a lot of people who do research. Very cool. For those of you who saw this last year, I'm repeating it now, but I am not somebody who knows Python. And the magic of ChatGPT to please help me uh, write some clustering algorithm, uh, a few lines of code, really not too many, to help me cluster your responses. And using the Google Collaboratory to do that, I'm able to um, take advantage of what I know is possible um, because of the help of, that ChatGPT can provide. So these are nice clustered, you can sort of see what people are here to do. And these are where the sort of one-offs where there were like just two or three people who might have said these kinds of things. And so there's this is a whole conglomeration down here uh, at the end. So it makes some things possible. With that, we also have uh, our first ever Taxon Works Together Awards. Uh, we'll be seeing if we have people to meet these various categories. So we are um, keeping an eye out and have some ideas. And um, we have some more about that for you coming up, but just be knowing that we are looking for this so that we can give out t-shirts afterwards. We're excited about that. Anything else you want to add, Matt? Um, no, this will be our first year on these awards. Uh, next year, we'll ask you to nominate some community members and we'll have some open nominations. Um, but we thought this would be a good way to sort of acknowledge all the broader contributions our community plays in. So this is our first sort of hybrid approach um, here. Cool. Thank you. So also, for those of you who've uh, had a chance, we know that some of you are here for specific sessions. This is our opportunity to, to highlight some of them. Um, we certainly are excited to offer this sort of different perspectives, both directly about Taxon Works and the use of Taxon Works, as well as broader topics that we're interested in across our biodiversity data community, uh, data quality, growing taxonomic communities, uh, conversations about how can we give you more agency when you find issues or get feedback from somebody, how can we make that uh, more useful to you? Um, 
when we have an open source community, how do we go about building that community and around uh, the code base? What about managing natural history collections in taxon works? And how does that relate uh, to your work and the work you might do in other systems, for example? Uh, sorry, oops. Here's the geospatial futures I mentioned, as well as things like our, our APIs. You'll hear more about that, uh, as well as our uh, business meeting, where you'll learn more about what's coming up in the future, as well as uh, the t-shirt awards. Next, we'll be talking about um, the adopters. And I believe that's what comes up next in our schedule after Matt tells us uh, a little bit more about what we've been up to uh, in TaxonWorks. Our community is uh, made up of various pieces and we are from the species file group um, endowed and we are open source. You can see all the things that we do and work on here. For Taxon Works itself, we then have a companion piece of software to produce Taxon pages, and we provide regular support in different formats uh, in our weekly sessions, as well as things that we share on YouTube, Slack, where we can have conversations together, um, and social media uh, on Fostodon, as well as sandboxes where you can experience Taxon Works and documentation that's community built to go along with it. Um, all of it would not be possible uh, without our participants and our collaborators. So thank you very much for that. And now at Taxon Works Together, as part of our community, we wanna say thank you for being here, for sharing your time, your knowledge, your ideas, and um, we have the notes ready to go. So um, let's get started. I'm super excited to see this many people here. I think this is maybe the most we've had at our intro. I see 84 people. And as we saw the people from all around the world and given that pool, I really think that Taxon Works is trying to hit that sweet spot of what a lot of you are doing, uh, research, digitization, trying to integrate a whole bunch of different things. So as you may have noted, um, it feels like we just did this. Taxon works together, and that's because it was six months ago. Uh, and what we've done is we've moved this meeting and conference to be in May. So it will be a full 12 months uh, from now, the next time we do that. But what you're gonna see here today is just a super quick overview for those of you who aren't familiar with Taxon Works about what we tried to do. And then I'm gonna try to highlight um, in the time we have, we we'll probably have to shove some things back to this afternoon as well the new features that have emerged just in those six months of the last little bit. So all the hard work that our, our team and our community has been doing. So um, again, this is all of course made possible as we mentioned by uh, the team and the various different collaborators. And as Debbie mentioned, we've got a really full slate in the next three, three days, um, a full day today and then half days the next. And really, we're not going to try to show too much off. We're just going to do a think of this first session as a bit of a high, highlight reel. Um, but I do want to reemphasize too that we really want to make this interactive. So we're going to be watching the chat. Debbie said it. Um, we're going to be asking you for for feedback, and we're going to pivot and change direction a lot uh, on demand based on what we get as input back from you. So that may be a little bit different from some of the other meetings that you're familiar with. So do raise your voice in many different ways. Um, thanks already for Nikki for participating in the chat document. We're hoping that we collectively take notes there and we want that to be a shared resource that's going to be permanently available um, for you to reference as we, we go through, maybe we went through something too quick, et cetera. So thanks for leading the way, Nikki, and demonstrating what we're, um, how to use that document. So again, we're gonna just spend two minutes on what TaxonWorks is, which is not nearly enough for a 10 year old project. And then we're gonna talk about highlights of the new features that you might've missed if you're uh, not as familiar with TaxonWorks. So one of the things that we're excited about TaxonWorks um, for is the fact that it's uh, quite diverse in what it tries to do. Uh, I'll be jumping out and demoing some things 
right now and you'll be able to get to these links. We'll share them in the chat and the document as we go, but we can come to the doc, the model, the, sorry, the TaxonWorks documentation, and you can get a full list of all of the different models in the project. And these are all interactive and that will help you get a feel for what kind of concepts we try to, to treat. We've made a little task that can summarize the projects in TaxonWorks into sort of crude subjective categories like this blue is about nomenclature and red is about digitization. Uh, orange is descriptive, so you can build character matrices and uh, help to help you describe phylogenetic data or taxonomic data. We have an excellent literature system, uh, a world class reference manager in TaxonWorks, and so a lot of, and you can cite everything in the software, so there's a lot of literature reference. And we have a very nice geospatial engine as well that um, brings a lot of questions and challenges to light. So here's a screenshot of the projects in TaxonWorks that have more than 10,000 records. And from the color, you can see that there's a lot of varying use. You have some projects in red that are almost completely about digitization, some in orange that are basically just building matrices or interactive keys. And you can see that you really need a system that can integrate across a lot of those diverse data models. We have over 40, I think, classes of data. Um, if you're going to give people the sort of expressive power that they need, right? There's projects that are very well balanced here uh, that do a little bit of everything and reference the past and reference the future. So we're very happy with the diversity of users and we're, um, I think the diversity of people here reflects that. That really gives us the opportunity to dive deeper into some of the challenges that we face in, in um, um, what we're doing. So I want to just highlight um, four or five quick things that we do, products that you can get out of TaxonWorks. Last year, we introduced the open source companion to TaxonWorks, Taxon Pages. So you can come to orthoptera.speciesfile.org, for example, and get access to tens of thousands of species pages in a new product. So we're summarizing essentially all of the data that's that rich data that you saw that's captured in these contexts. Uh, there'll be lots more on uh, being able to show off taxon pages as we go on. Almost 19% of the catalog of life, for those of you who are familiar, maybe we can get a link in the chat for that as well, um, flows, through catalog, throw, flows through taxon works either directly or through the, sort of the validation scripting engine, thanks to a lot of Jeff Ower's work there. So we're a great um, contributor to the catalog of life. Last year, we started integrating some of the nomenclatural resources and authority that we have um, into iNaturalist with some collaboration from there. So a lot of the names that you see in the taxonomic backbone that's in iNaturalist is fed and served through um, TaxonWorks, and we're really excited and happy to have that be the case. Collections managers like Tommy that I think snuck in here, on the, sort of maybe lurking on the side, are exporting um, over a million specimens to GBIF uh, in the Darwin Core Archive format, so collections can manage their projects and export the data there too. So another major sort of semantic bit of coverage that we have. And what we're sort of getting to at this point in the life of the project is this um, idea of supporting publications or products that come are derived from the data that you've worked hard to manage over a long period of time. So here you're seeing a, a bit of a catalog format, and I'm quite sure that I think one of our present, Samantha is maybe gonna cover what, sh what um, was done in terms of using this to help get publications out. A lot of you said you are researchers and publishing, and that still remains an important component of what we do today. So products in support of peer reviewed publications or just publications, if that's your, um, you know, if that's what you need to do and, and be rewarded for. Um, any qu quick questions? We're running a little bit behind time, but I would, I just, we're just going to routinely pause throughout this whole meeting for questions, and we'll look for those in chat, and maybe if somebody sees them in uh, the Google Doc, that they could also relay them by voice here. We'll give it uh, one minute here.
Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about what changed in the last six months, what's new, what's cool. Uh, but I also want to point out, as we did last year, that we maintain a change log that has the complete history up to a couple years ago of everything that's been changed. And so we try to communicate and be transparent as to what we're doing. And that change log is accessible um, to you. I'll drop it in the chat here. At any time, you can come and see what's going on there. So if you want to get the nitty gritty details, you'll see a lot of bug fixes and stuff that we're not gonna talk about here. Um, you can come and see them on the change log. We also announce on Mastodon, we have a Mastodon account at Taxonworks. Maybe we can share that link as well. Um, we also announce our, our sort of um, point one level re releases and higher there. So if you want to sort of get a feel for what's emerging there, we, we try to highlight things there on our Mastodon account. All right, one of the first things we did this year is introduced a new level of semantics, what we call a field occurrence. Um, this is essentially the ability to capture what iNaturalist captures, where you go out to the field and you take an image, but you don't actually voucher the specimen. And we've been meaning to do this for a long time in TaxonWorks. Our models are fairly um, what we would call opinionated or conventional. So when we create a record, we mean we create an instance of that thing. And we, our existing model was to create specimen records, which means you had a physical record um, in a in a in a repository, the field occurrence essentially lets us use the collecting event model that we have, and um, link that to a taxon determination, and essentially capture that level of data. I won't show too much of it, but there's a wonderful new form built by Jose. Um, it has a lot of the features that you'll get familiar with if you use taxon works, being able to lock values rows over rows. Um, smart selectors that predict what kind of data that you've used or accessed or created recently and present that to you. You'll have access to um, help documentation, uh, an advanced clipboard, and things like a pin board that lets you pin data that you want to reference as you're capturing the data. So I don't have the time to explain this further, but we can go into that this afternoon if people want to see more of that adventure. We've got a lot of work to do to we have the ability to capture all of this data now in this field occurrence class, but we need to also spend more time um, integrating it and you know, into the sort of other core features that TaxonWorks has to do. But that was a major milestone. This was uh, needed for essentially people capturing literature-based data and going out in the field and capturing the kind of observation data that we're familiar with from uh, iNaturalist. Questions about the field occurrence model? One of our goals in the longer term too here is to sort of have an import framework where uh, you know, folks like Samuel, I think is here, has asked how can we cross-reference our data and that rich data that's been captured at iNaturalist and sort of integrate that into your research platform like TaxonWorks. So Matt, can I, can I take a minute to say sure. something then? I'll yeah. just really quickly. So some of you, depending on your collection management software, and we haven't really asked or how what software you use to manage your data. Um, oh, Sam, what was, oh, you, you answered the question? <laughs> I see Sam's comment. I wanted to say what we've done is we're, we're trying to extend the model, right? So that when you go out and you observe as opposed to voucher, that our software can do that as well. Just making it clear to those of you who are more familiar with um, sort of a more traditional collection management software where it's all about physical objects. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify that. We need to, yeah, thanks, Debbie. What we know is that when we go to publish, for example, a taxonomic treatment, um, that we're merging new data um, that we've captured off of specimens, but also the historic, you know, 250 years of data that we have from the literature. And um, we want to accurately represent that. You can think of this as sort of a sort of a, a pivot on the idea of occurrences from Tadwig that um, some people feel there are some issues with that concept. So we're trying to kind of clean that up a little bit. And we realize that we wanna sort of aggregate and summarize all of that in kind of a monographic framework. Okay, um, 
Next, we've got um, a dichotomous key engine. Um, thanks to Tom Klein, and you'll hear more about that. Um, we are extremely grateful to Tom, who came to us out of the blue. I don't know if I see Tom here. Um, we don't here. really we don't really know who Tom is, but um, to be honest, but Tom has provided a whole bunch of code. I do see Tom here to Taxon Works in our community. Um, he migrated a feature that was in MX. So some of you might know a precursor to this. He took that code and migrated in a, in a very wonderful way, uh, that code forward so that you can build dichotomous keys. And um, I can't say how grateful I am enough to Tom, you're gonna hear that, say if your ears are burning for, for that work. It was really sort of validated our approach in Taxon Works of creating an open source project and trying to be accessible to developers. So um, what we have and what Tom did is he, is he built sort of a full stack, I'll use a technical term, all the way from the database model to the user interface. Um, he, he contributed at all those levels. And that was really one of our goals. If you come to, I'm going to just pivot around here, taxonworks.org, you'll see that we're really about trying to be for scientists, but also for developers. We're trying to facilitate that kind of work. And um, Tom has really the, been the first person who came along and demonstrated. No, I shouldn't say that's the first. We've had some wonderful contributions from Dash Peter at AntWeb, etc. cetera. But, um, but um, Tom really came and let us build this first level of uh, fun, or, uh, demonstrated that we can do this in TaxonWorks. So, our code is accessible enough to make these levels of contributions. So thanks, Nikki, for the question. Is this a plugin or a core code? This is core code contribution. Um, there is an API behind it. And one of our goals is um, to make this a plugin so that you can read off of that, um, this data. We'll make that plugin as generic as we can so that you could use that key engine and for, for, for bifurcating and, um, Multifurcating keys, that should be very possible. So there'll be a generic JSON format of data. Again, sorry for those of you who are not that technical, but um, yeah, Nikki, we want to basically make a viewer for this ultimately. But for now, we need to be able to create and manage and support your research. So I'm just gonna create a new key here just in 30 seconds. And um, let's see, most tasty um, colors, right? Um, how uh, colors taste to you. So we're going to create a new key. And um, I'll hide this little intro and I'll just start adding couplets. So you know, natural colors and maybe uh, artificial colors over here. Um, I'll update it. And on my left couplet, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to say orange and purple. Right. And I'm going to update those. So now I can come back up to my natural colors. I can come across to the artificial colors. I can say chrome and I don't know, what's an unofficial color? Um, uh, flamingo, no, flamingo is natural. I don't know. Uh, chrome and uh, chat, what, what should I put here as an artificial color? No such thing, but we're having fun. Artificial color suggestion. Vanta black. Perfect. Wonderful example. I love it. Um, so we're going to update that. Um, now, when I come back up to my, my colors, I can see the future, right? Really cool. I see that orange and purple are on the future and chrome and Vanta black are there. Um, so you can imagine this going on. You can link into your OTUs. You can illustrate every couplet of the whole thing. I'm going to go drop back to the, um, the hub that, that Tom built. And here I can see my my um, my most tasty colors key, and I can visualize it um, just by clicking it. So there's an inline viewer here, and it gets quite powerful. You can imagine a couple like, for example, this kind of thing is super useful for capturing historical keys and making them much more functional because you can see the future and the past. So, again, we're excited to see that and look for uh, plugins that happen into taxon pages and just generic plugins as well that might help you display dichotomous keys. Thank you, Tom, for that work. Um, we did a lot of what we call unified filter tooling last year. If you were here, we made uh, a new set of um, tools or we had a new set of core functionality called unified filtering. And now we're building a lot of functionality on top of the power behind that scene. 
So for example, we created a simple new week in review um, visualization for your project here. I'm looking at the INHS insect collection and I can see things like um, the amount of time spent there. But more importantly here, I can see summaries of kind of the data that were created. And what the unified filter integration is doing is it's making these actionable. So here I can see that Michelle created five taxon names in the last week. And the actionable part is that I can click on this and I'm taken to that subset of records in the unified filter framework. So here I can see that she um, created these names, right? And I can quickly pivot. If those of you who remember the unified filters, I can say, send all of those names and show me all of the collection objects that are related to the, all of those names. And here I have the 23 collection objects behind those names. I can pivot that and say, show me all of the collecting events behind that data. Um, and then I can go and get various um, derivative reports, et cetera, from there. So lots of integration with, um, with uh, the unified filters. We created a whole bunch of reports for, um, for uh, that get played off of the biologic, uh, played off of the filters, sorry. Those are becoming accessible via what we call the linker functionality. So I can say here's 955 um, records of coleoptera relationships, biological associations in the collection. And I can ask for summaries of various different formats here um, in, in table views. So simplified views of those biological associations, those graph networks here. Um, so there's um, biological associations that can be summarized. There's a geospatial summary that you can see. Let's see if I can call that one up. Um, if I click here and I click uh, spatial summary, you're starting to see more and more of these reports emerge. Um, this was used to help the, some of the AntWeb folks to see which kind of data have been assigned. I won't get into the details here with some quick visualizations of outliers, uh, thanks to some ideas from OpenRefine and, and Debbie's pr uh, prompting there. But you get the idea that what we have is the ability to go from a set of results to um, various different different reports here coming out here. Um, the last one is a specimen summary. Again, we can come from a filtered set of collection objects and get a whole bunch of metadata. The taxa that were there, the um, repositories that they were in, the types, um, metadata, et cetera there. I won't go into that. Um, at the UI level, we added features that can allow you to customize your layouts. Um, you can come and see a set of results here in the filtered results. And over here, we have a bunch of built-in ways of visualizing the data that you can see. We've got a lot of different attributes. So I can say, show me all of the columns that are about the place with respect to these collection objects. But you can also then customize whatever fields you want to see. And you can see that there's a lot of fields and as you customize these um, fields, taking off, maybe I just want to see um, a couple of Darwin core occurrence fields. Uh, let's see, I'll just do a couple of that and some identifiers. Um, I'll lock down to just those fields. And this is saved now in your user preferences, new this year. So some excellent ways to customize your views onto the data have emerged. And thanks to Jose for building that out. Um, we've Let's see, what's the batch here? Collecting event filter, ah, yeah. Another big thing is that now that we have all of these powerful ways to filter the data, we want to be able to update them. And we've added at least 15 different ways, I think by my count of being able to batch update specific data points. So I can select a couple of records, either the whole record set or individual rows. And I can come over here and click various options to, for example, set all of the fields that are missing for those records, um, set the date and time, update all of that collective ones. I can add people records, creating roles and therefore linking um, collecting events to things like ORCID IDs. I can move them to new geographic areas or update their sort of uh, geographic uh, levels assignments. And so there's many different options now to be able to, to operate with um, across multiple different records now. Uh, and then we've added some new facets as well. So being able to say, I want everything that was in this first result, but not those things in that like next result. So lots of tooling built onto that core functionality that came out last year. Any questions on that quickly? Thanks, Gregory. Um, 
One of the main questions I want to query is Texa by hoster distribution. In brief, Gregory, I would say that, yes, we have um, functionality to query by host. Um, so let me see here. What's the quickest way if I come back to my links here and click over to my biological associations filter. Um, very briefly, I'll, you'll see that here's our query interface on top of biological associations. And these can be added as a graph level. They can be added between OTUs and taxa, or sorry, OTUs and OTUs, or, or taxa and taxa, and specimens and taxa, or specimens and specimens. So you can express complicated uh, relationships all with a controlled vocabulary of relationship types and some other metadata. You can search on those um, spatially through a nomenclatural hierarchy and in a bunch of other significant number of other ways. You can do things like take a set of specimens and then say, show me all of the, the data that you have for those specimens that are linked into the biological association. So um, yeah, we've really built out a lot of that kind of core functionality, like, you know, go to the specimen filter, select China, get a list of specimens, and then in the unified filters, you can say for that set of specimens, show me all of the other things, right? So for this set of biological associations here, show me all of the collection objects that are referenced in that, in that result. So I'm sending that one result and I'm moving it over, pivoting the result or pivoting the, the filter result sending it to a new um, format as we get over here. So in this set of relationships here, um, I can see that there's 23 specific records that relate to probably the subject of that. And yeah, here I, you can see I've customized my views to show those identifiers, but here I'm getting the specimens for that. From there, I could then send this set of specimens on to the collecting events for those records, which would give me some spatial information, et cetera. So. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a hint and we can try to tease that out with more specific examples uh, this afternoon, if you can be around. Keep going here. Um, one of the things that we've long understood is that complex data models and complex data, biological data are very complex, um, means that we get a lot of different values in a lot of different fields. And we've known about the power of being able to explore our data for a long time in different sort of frameworks. And we've sort of built some of that into TaxonWorks now. So one of them is a, one of those new tasks is called a project vocabulary um, explorer. So here I'm going to search for um, in within the collecting event model, you'll see that in TaxonWorks, because we have all of these classes of data, we can quickly give you expanded functionality that works across all of those classes of data rather than just one thing. So for example, because we can cite anything, uh, we can cite the collection objects or taxon concepts or nomenclature. Um, and that's because of sort of this foundation that we have. So similarly, I can choose any model here. I'm gonna choose collecting events and um, verbatim locality. And I'm gonna say, uh, show me all the things that contain Paris. And you're getting no result because I'm not in the right project here. So I'm just gonna pivot. Um, to the, collect, the insect collection here at INHS. And let's try that one more time. So here I'm looking for all of the fields or all of the values in the field that we call verbatim locality that contain the word Paris. And I've got a little table here that summarizes that you can see um, 100 different records. You'll see that there's also a limit to the number of records to scoping, and you'll see a word cloud here. What's cool is we mentioned the fact that the filters are actionable. And so now I can come and I can click on one of these records here that I see and I want to operate on. Maybe I see a spelling error, or maybe I see some commas out of place, or maybe I'm curious as to what's going on. And here I have that result set actionable um, in that filtered result. So I can move forward into looking at other data or I can start batch updating and fixing that data. So um, a very cool sort of pro simple interface that lets you explore your data in um, the values that are stored in there and help you to make both targeted discoveries and sort of serendipitous discoveries as well. Uh, we've known that you can do this kind of thing for a long time. And again, thanks to Debbie to pushing this idea and we saw this forward um, this this year or this in the last six months. So it's pretty cool. We're still exploring how we can expand 
um, the actions that you can take off of this uh, functionality. Um, another very cool feature that was built out, and this is thanks to, again, our community coming to us and saying, uh, Lily came to us and said, I just spent a week in TaxonWorks moving through records one at a time, doing all of this editing. And, you know, there's things that when you have a system like TaxonWorks, when you hear that the users are, or our collaborators are doing something like that, that's painful and repetitive, those are the real opportunities for improvement for us. And that's, that's why a really open communication channel about the good and the bad is really important to us. Um, so we got and bear down and focused on creating what we're calling a field synchronizer. Uh, and this is a super exciting task that we're just sort of scratching the surface on um, being able to take advantage of. So let's see here. I'm in the, oops, I need to just fix this link here quick. I'll just see if I can demo it in one minute. So here I'm in the collecting event filter. I can come from here and I can pivot to a set of results. I'm just gonna take a generic first 50 records. Maybe let's make it first 250 records. Um, and then I want to go and I want to send that here again to the integration with this result set. So I'm gonna take this result set of 250 records and I'm going to send that, just these 250, to the field synchronizing task. And I get an error. Yay. Um, let's just redo this. Query stream. Ah, I know how to do this. Um, let's just let's just do the whole 250. Sorry, hold with me. Jose, that's a post, not a get that we need to do. Let's step back one second. Oops. Let's get the link right. All right, so we're going to, uh, let's filter, let's just do a quick spatial filter. Um, I'm on collecting events. I wanna see something around my hometown here in Saskatchewan. I'm gonna filter uh, within the INHS collection. I find 97 records in the spatial area. I'm gonna send that to the field synchronizer. Um, and so here again, you'll recognize something slightly similar. I can choose any of the um, fields here and I get to see those values over here. And what this does is this allows us to do transformations between or across fields or data attributes. Um, so I'm also gonna choose a control vocabulary term. Think of this as an extended column. And I'm gonna put, um, let's call, let's just pick water body. This is an attribute that the collection has done. And here I can start adding functions. So I can go from this verbatim uh, label field to the water body field. Maybe I want to extract some some data. So let's just try to do a match and I'm gonna do a uh, river, right? And so here I can see that I've matched the value in verbatim locality and I've matched the string river. And I can then um, update all four fields in my um, field to be river there. Let's change this to be water body so that we can extract from this field to this field. Um, so here I'm going to extract river into that, but I can do much more powerful than that. I can do um, regular expressions in here. So let's do dot star, something that starts with the river. And, and now I can see that I'm matching exactly um, the big river, et cetera. And you get the idea. I can come and click apply all. And here I've extracted from a verbatim label, sp very specific fields here. So I don't have much more time to show what you can do with this. It's extremely powerful. Think of it as updating individual records. You can also click and edit any one of these fields um, just by, by typing in them. You can do things like fill all the empty cells or replace all of the cells, um, et cetera. And again, this works off of any um, filtered set of results. So um, thanks, Samuel. It is cool and we, we now that we have this in place, we're really just starting to understand what else we can do. Um, you can do date extraction here, of course, things like um, some digit followed by a dash, followed by some set of digits, followed by a dash, followed by IV or um, X maybe, one or more of those, followed by, uh, let's see, what's the actual pattern here? I'm looking at this, trying to convert it on the fly. Some digit 
followed by a period. Um, so yeah, here I'm doing date extraction, right? Some digits followed by a period, followed by some Roman numerals, um, one or more Roman numerals, followed by a dash, followed by one or more digits. Um, so boom, here I've got a date extraction pattern. And we'll all, um, we'll all be sharing these patterns that help us do this kind of date extraction and other kind of data extraction as we learn them and it can sort of more and more formalize them. Yeah, so regular expressions, we can say a little bit more about those this afternoon. They're essentially powerful matching um, features that you can do in find and replace. Think of them as that way. So super cool. We're very excited about it. Um, and we're glad we got it done. You can imagine that Lily was being asked to take all of the uh, information about a body of water out of one field and put it in another. And she was having to go from one record, just seeing that record, to the next, to the next, to the next. Here, even if I'm not using find and replace, I can copy and paste, I can simply type. Um, I've got all of the target values in those fields side by side, actionable, just right there. And you can just grind through them. Very neat. Um, let's see. Questions about field synchronize there? I've got about There's four more. Lovely four comments more. in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Samuel. And um, Alina, we're glad that you are saying that it's new to you. you yeah. We right. don't need to, you don't need to apologize for that. Um, yeah. We can, it's, you know. yeah. We've already had wonderful discussions about regular expressions with our regular Wednesday meetings and the people that join us there. Um, it's the kind of thing where even if you're not a TaxonWorks media user, coming to a meeting like this or coming to a, one of our events and hearing about regular expressions can give you uh, an inroad to a lot of power with whatever you do. You can do it. Um, you can use regular expressions in Refine or Python or Ruby or Word or Excel. Everything has this level of kind of cool, advanced find and replace. And you can, like Debbie said, you don't need regular expressions, um, but it's cool to be aware that they're there and they're everywhere once you get to know them. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Uh, ChatGPT does, allows you to help. There's a million different, if you're curious about um, regular.com, there's many different um, ways to test your regular expressions. So this is my number string. Um, so here I can say that I know that slash D matches a digit, right? Slash D4 matches exactly four digits, matches exactly three digits. So you can come and experiment by pasting in your text and doing these kind of things. And this is just one website, rubular.com. There's many, many of these. These are ubiquitous in the programming world, and we're hoping to make them ubiquitous in powerful tools like TaxonWorks as well. Two minutes. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I want to wrap up with maybe one of the cooler things functional wise is um, what we're calling freeform digitization. So here I am starting with an interface that's asking me just very simply to drop an image. Um, and I'm going to go, let's see here, new demo files. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my fossil. I haven't named this file anything. I don't need to. Um, if you're renaming images in your digitization process, we need to chat. Um, is, is one of the short messages here. But what we get is an interface that shows me the, the specimen and you'll start to see some of these other fields that you're getting familiar with, how they look in TaxonWorks. I can lock in the thing that says, um, you know, this is a fresh compression fossil. I can lock in this value. I can say that this is all going um, a fossil that's in the PRI um, paleontology collection at a determination. Maybe I just want to say they're all animalia. Um, I can assign tags, right, um, et cetera, that I can lock all of these values in as well. So as I'm going and adding these values, I'm going to lock, let's see that, I'm going to lock this um, just to show that this can be, this is a demo, um, I'm going to lock that, I'm going to add that note. So once I start digitizing my specimens um, here, I'm just going to draw on them with a couple of pretty familiar drawable features. I've got my uh, shape that added there and I can save a new um, and I've clicked and I've created that record. You can see that I've got something in review over here. And after you do this a number of different times, you've got, you've just basically stubbed digital specimen records 
on one image as annotations. Here I've done six of them, and so I can click and highlight all of the things that I've done. I did this one twice. Um, so think of it as digitizing by drawing on your image. And this is not just fossils or matrices. Imagine taking an image of a malaise trap sample or your favorite bulk sample in the field and being able to draw and then assign all of that rich extended metadata that you need to on top of that um, specimen. So a very cool interface that we're excited to do. Um, let me see, I'm just trying to get a feel for what else I've got here. Yeah, this is the last, just one last slide. Um, for miscellaneous features. One of the very cool things we did is we added automatic image deduplication. So you saw me drag and drop an image there. And what happens is if you drop the same image twice, we detect by the binary content of the image that you've done that. And we just pretend that you want to use the image that you already loaded. So this is very cool uh, functionality. Um, it allows you to just drop images into play in many different contexts and make sure that you're only storing one copy behind the sends. We greatly improved our aggregate maps that you see on taxon pages. Um, we've done a lot of extensions in the last six months semantically. We're always thinking that we've got more CSV and API endpoints. Uh, and for import wise, we've also made a lot of important um, updates to the being able to import our Darwin core fields. You can see more of that this afternoon or in the digitization uh, session that is going to be very open in a couple of days. We'll go through some of that. So. Um, I need to wrap up to keep going here. Um, I do see a question from Fritz. Thanks so much. So when locking values in the freeform digitization, it's like a carry forward functionality. Exactly, Fritz, you nailed it. It's just carry forward. Do you allow similar functionality when entering specimens one by one? Uh -huh. Yep, you can lock any field. We have a field called a task called comprehensive digitization. And um, there's lots of powerful ways. Essentially, every facet of that format, you can lock in fields that you want to carry forward. Yep. Uh, and in fact, there's a very cool, if you just came in off the field, you can add a single collecting event and you can stub 20 records and you'll automatically create catalog numbers for those um, and whatever other basic metadata that you want. We can again demo that this afternoon. So. A huge thanks, everybody. We're only two minutes over time, which is not bad. I made up eight minutes. For me, that's really great. Um, again, we can get dive into a lot more detail. We've got a couple hours this afternoon, and we've got lots of time throughout the week to dive further into this. So thanks very much who, for everybody. It seems like it felt like six months, and maybe we didn't get as much done, but we really did a lot. And I'm very grateful for everybody, Tom, our external our internal Jose and everybody who, who did all the work here. So thank you. And thanks again, everybody for being here on this first session.